Dear students, today we will talk about histology of the organs of female reproductive system. This topic we divided into two parts. It's the first part and it includes histology of the ovaries, follicles, corpus luteum and ovogenesis. And in the second part we will talk about uterus, fallopian tubes, vagina, mammary glands and menstrual cycle. So let's go to the classification of the organs of female reproductive system. This system includes inner and outer or internal and external organs. Internal organs of female reproductive system they include ovaries or main reproductive glands, here we can see them, and also there are oviducts, uterus and vagina. Those organs they have wall and they have a lumen or cavity, so they are hollow organs which form reproductive tract. So there are glands, solid organs which are ovaries, and also organs of the female reproductive tract, oviducts or fallopian tubes or uterine tubes, uterus and vagina. And about the reproductive tract we will talk in the second part of this system. And also there are external organs of female reproductive system and memory glands, additional organs of reproductive system. And uh, those organs, they provide basic functions. So the basic functions of female reproductive system is reproductive, endocrine, intrauterine development of the fetus and secretion of milk. And female reproductive system, it has some similarities with male reproductive system in their functions and also in the structure. So the similar functions of female and male reproductive systems are reproductive and endocrine uh, functions. Uh, first of all, uh, female reproductive system, it provides reproductive function. It's production of female gametes, which are called ovocytes or ova. And they are produced in the ovaries and process of their production, it's called ovogenesis. Here we can see ovaries and there are development ova, which are result of the ovogenesis. And male reproductive system, it has similar function, it has also reproductive function, it's production of male gametes, uh, spermatozoa, which uh, are provided by the testes, uh, male um, gonads, so there are male gonads, testes, and ovaries, they are female gonads, and they have similar function, it's called reproductive. Uh, ovaries, they provide ovogenesis, formation of ova, and uh, testes, they provide spermatogenesis, formation of spermatozoa. Second function is endocrine function, it's secretion of female sex hormones uh, such as estrogens and progesterone. And this function is also provided by the ovaries. Here we can see ovaries and there are different endocrine structures which provide secretion of female hormones. And this function also is similar to endocrine function of male reproductive system. And male reproductive system it also provides secretion of se sex hormones, but male hormone it's a uh, androgens, uh, it's testosterone. So two organs, two gonads, ovaries and testes, they provide endocrine functions, but they produce different kinds of hormones. And also there are two functions of uh, female reproductive system which are absent in male reproductive system. It's intrauterine development of the fetus, it's provided by the uterus, and also secretion of milk, which is provided by the mammary gland, and it's uh, needed for the nutrition of baby after delivery. Uh, so let's go to the structure of the organs of female reproductive system. And we'll begin from the main reproductive gland, its ovary. So, as you already know, ovary provides two basic functions of uh, female reproductive system. It's reproductive, production of female gametes, or sites or ova. Here we can see developing ova uh, on different uh, stages of their development. And another function is endocrine, secretion of hormones, estrogens, uh, which are produced by the follicles, and progesterone, which is uh, produced by the corpus luteum. And today we will talk about them. Uh, so, two basic functions, and now let's look at the structure of the ovary, how the structure uh, helps to provide the functions. Uh, tissue of the ovary consists of two basic parts. It's outer part of the ovary, which is called cortex. Here you can see the cortex of the ovary. And inner part of the ovary, it's called medulla. Here you can see medulla, inner part, and its cortex, outer part. And let's look at this diagram. Its outer part of the ovary, it's called cortex. 
and it contains connective tissue and follicles with their derivatives. Here we can see them, it's cortex, and inner part of the ovary, it's medulla. Here we can see this medulla. And also ovary is covered with connective tissue capsule, uh, which is called tunica albuginea. Here we can see it. It's similar to tunica albuginea in the testes. And the outermost layer is called germinal epithelium. So let's talk about those parts step by step. Uh, here we can see outer part its cortex and inner part its medulla covering its tunica albuginea or capsule and germinal epithelium, its basic structure of the ovary. And here on this microphotograph we can see outer layer its cortex, it, its medulla, and uh, cortex it contains follicles on different stages of their development and their derivatives. And also there is a tunica albuginea capsule of the ovary and germinal epithelium. So, what is present in the cortex? Cortex of the ovary is composed of two basic components. It's stroma, it's loose fibrous connective tissue, and parenchyma, it's follicles and their derivatives. Uh, so, uh, there are different organs of visceral systems, such as uh, female male reproductive systems, digestive, uh, urinary, respiratory systems, and those systems, they contain two basic types of the organs. There are hollow and parenchymal or solid organs. Hollow organs, they contain lumen and wool, uh, like organs of uh, digestive tract, reproductive tract, uh, urinary tract, and also there are solid or parenchymal organs. Uh, those organs include ovaries, testes, kidneys, also there are lungs, um, liver, pancreas. They are solid, they have solid tissue, and this solid tissue it includes two basic components, it's stroma and parenchyma. In all those organs, listed organs, there are stroma and parenchyma. And uh, stroma is similar in all those organs, it's non-specific. Here we can see loose fibrous connective tissue, which fills the space. It contains blood vessels, nerves, which are needed for the nutrition, for the feeding of different structures of parenchyma. So stroma is non-specific part of the organ, and it doesn't provide the functions of the organ, but is needed for the functioning of parenchyma. And parenchyma is different in all those organs, and it's specific. And parenchyma, it provides the main function of the organ. Usually parenchyma is formed by epithelial tissue. So in the ovary, parenchyma is formed by the follicles and their derivatives. Here we can see parenchyma, it includes different follicles, and also there are different derivatives of the follicles. So there are two basic parts of the uh, cortex of the ovary, stroma and parenchyma. And uh, here we can see uh, follicles, they form parenchyma of the ovary, and between them there is connective tissue, which forms stroma. There are follicles and their derivatives, for example, it's corpus luteum, it's parenchyma, it's functioning part of the organ, specific part, which provides ovogenesis, it's provided by the follicles, and endocrine function, uh, it uh, includes follicles, which produce estrogens, and corpus luteum, which provides production of progesterone. And stroma, it's connective tissue, which fills the spaces between those structures, and it helps to provide their functions, so it's supportive uh, or filling part of the organ. And here on big magnification, we can see cortex of the ovary, there are different follicles, numerous follicles, they contain developing ovum inside, and uh, between the follicles we can find stroma. It's connective tissue which fills the spaces between the follicles. And entire ovary is covered with capsule, it's tunica albuginea, and also there is germinal epithelium. And medulla uh, of the ovary, it's loose connective tissue, it's stroma, so medulla it contains stroma only and parenchyma is absent in medulla. Uh, and also in medulla of the ovary there are biggest blood vessels which in, uh, enter in the ovary inside the medulla and they are small branches they are going to the cortex and also uh, lymphatic vessels nerves they enter in the ovary via medulla 
So it's the innermost part of the ovary and medulla it uh, doesn't provide functions of the ovary but it's needed for the support of the cortical structure. So it's like the core of the ovary and uh, it contains only stroma. It's loose fibrous connective tissue. And here we can see cortex of the ovary and the innermost part, its medulla, its connective tissue, which uh, forms innermost part, its core of the ovary, which contains different blood vessels, nerves, which are needed for the nutrition of the cortex. And the surface of the ovary is covered by cuboidal germinal epithelium and connective tissue is tunica albuginea. So, what is germinal epithelium? It's simple cuboidal or sometimes columnar epithelium and it's modified peritoneum. Ovaries, they are organs of abdominal cavity and they are covered with peritoneum. And this peritoneum, which is attached to the surface of the ovary, is uh, modified. Typical structure of the peritoneum is simple squamous epithelium called mesocelium and very thin layer of loose connective tissue, which underlies the epithelium. And in the ovaries, this epithelium is not uh, squamous, it's cuboidal or even columnar. And this epithelium is called germinal epithelium. Uh, and this uh, name, it's traditional name, which uh, is because of embryological features, because it's related with follicular cells, uh, and follicular cells they derive from this germinal epithelium. Uh, so it gives the traditional name for the germinal epithelium of the surface of the ovary. But you should know that it's modified uh, cells of peritoneum and it's the only place in human organism where mesocelium, usually simple squamous epithelium, can be cuboidal or even columnar. And under this germinal epithelium there is a thin layer of dense fibrous connective tissue which is called tunica albuginea, it's connective tissue capsule of the ovary. And uh, if you remember structure of testis or revise this topic, testis uh, it also has tunica albuginea connective tissue capsule. And um, this capsule in testis it's thicker and in ovaries it's thinner because it's involved in the ovulation, so it should be thin uh, to be uh, accessible uh, for the ovulation. Later we'll see why uh, small thickness is needed for the ovulation. So uh, ovary is covered with tunica albuginea and tunica albuginea is covered with cuboidal germinal epithelium. It's germinal epithelium and under it we can see tunica albuginea and deeper we can see follicles and uh, stroma which surrounds them. So let's make a summary uh, on the basic histology of the ovary. The outer layer of the ovary is uh, cortex, which contains stroma, non-specific part, and uh, parenchyma, specific part, which is composed of follicles and their derivatives. Also, there is medulla, inner part, it uh, contains only stroma, and also there are blood vessels and nerves and lymphatic vessels, which enter in the follicle uh, in the ovary through the medulla. And uh, ovary, entire ovary is covered with tunica albuginea, its connective tissue capsule, and this connective tissue is dense, stroma, its uh, loose fibrous connective tissue, stroma of the cortex and medulla, and uh, stroma of tunica albuginea, uh, tunica albuginea is also involved in stroma. It's dense connective tissue, it's uh, s more, more denser uh, than uh, connective tissue of stroma. And uh, outermost layer of the covering of the ovary its germinal epithelium modified peritoneum. And now let's go to the detailed structure of the ovarian structures. Here we can see outer layer its cortex, different follicles on different stages, its tunica albuginea and germinal epithelium, and the innermost part of the ovary its uh, medulla with uh, big blood vessels which enter in the ovary in this region. And there are follicles, they are different, uh, and because they are on different stages of their development. And also there are derivatives of the follicles, it's corpus luteum, corpus albicans, and also there are athletic uh, follicles and athletic bodies. And uh, let's look at them. So the basic structures of the parenchyma of the ovary are the follicles, and also there are derivatives of the follicles, and uh, follicles are different. And uh, they have different size, different appearance, and let's uh, list the kinds of the follicles. 
So the smallest follicles are called primordial follicles. Here we can see primordial follicles. They are located on the, the tunica albuginea in the most superficial parts of the uh, ovarian cortex. They are called primordial and they are the most numerous and the smallest. And uh, next follicles are called primary. Here we can see primary follicles. They are bigger than primordial. Here we can see early and late primary. And primary follicles, they develop from primordial as a result of their growth. So primordial follicles, they begin to grow at some moment and they become to be primary early and then late primary follicles. And after that, primary follicles, they continue their growth and they become to be secondary follicles. Here we can see secondary and they are bigger than primary. Here we can see secondary. And after that, secondary follicles, after they are growth, uh, they become to be tertiary or graphian follicles. Here we can see tertiary or graphian follicle. It's the biggest. Uh, so there are following stages of the follicles, primordial, primary, secondary and tertiary or graphian. And they are the following stages of the development. So this development is called growth of the follicles or follicular genesis. And here we can see different kinds of the follicles. It's primordial follicles, uh, early and late primary follicles. And uh, each follicle it contains developing ohm and different additional structures. Later we will talk about them. And uh, follicles, they form some follicular derivatives. Uh, not only the follicles may be present in the uh, ovaries, also there are derivatives of the follicles. So tertiary graphian follicle, after the ovulation, it forms corpus luteum. And corpus luteum, it uh, becomes to be corpus albicans after some days. And also uh, follicular derivatives are, uh, here we can see for formation of corpus luteum. And also uh, there are atretic and uh, follicle and atretic body. They also are uh, derivatives of the follicles. And today we will talk about this cycle of the development of the follicles and formation of the derivatives of the follicles. Uh, and uh, first of all, let's uh, look at the growth of the follicles. They are changes and this growth of the follicles is called follicular genesis. Uh, here we can see formation uh, of the follicles of mature follicle and it's the final stage. And this growth of the follicles is under control of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which is produced in the uh, hypophysis, adenohypophysis. It's follicle stimulating hormone and it stimulates growth of the follicles. So here we can see these follicles, they are gradual uh, transformations and they are controlled by uh, FSH. And let's look at these follicles. Uh, so here we can see primordial, primary, secondary and tertiary primordial follicle. It's early and uh, late primary follicle. It becomes to be late. Uh, it's secondary and tertiary follicle. And those uh, changes are called follicular genesis. And uh, you should know that primordial follicles, they aren't controlled by FSH. They aren't sensitive by FSH. And beginning from primary follicle, uh, follicles, they uh, become to be sensitive for FSH. Uh, so, this stage of development, primary, secondary and tertiary, it's controlled by FSH. And primordial follicles and their growth to primary, it's a stage which is uh, hormone independent. And this stage, it's called uh, small or minor growth. It's non-controlled uh, by FSH. And it lasts for many years. So this growth begins in early embryogenesis when a mother of girl is pregnant and a development of follicles uh, begins. Uh, and it lasts uh, till puberty and till uh, reproductive age. So it takes many years, this small or minor growth. And it's very slow because it's not controlled by FSH and its growth of primordial follicles. And after that, primary uh, follicles, they become to be sensitive for FSH. 
and uh, they begin to grow and form uh, they form uh, secondary and tertiary follicles and this stage of growth it's called big or major growth and it's hormone dependent it's growth of primary secondary and tertiary follicles and it's stimulated by fsh so minor growth it's growth of primordial follicles and it's uh, hormone independent and hormone dependent major growth it's growth of primary secondary and tertiary follicles which are controlled by fsh and while uh, minor growth takes many years uh, it's very slow uh, big or major growth it's fast and it takes only two weeks so transformation till tertiary follicle it takes two weeks because it's stimulated by fsh follicle stimulating hormone which is produced in adenohypophysis so here we can see uh, resting follicles uh, and all they are primordial uh, and till puberty in the ovaries of girl there are only primordial follicles they are aren't sensitive for fsh and fsh is not produced and all the follicles are in minor growth they are growing very very slowly and without influence of any hormone and uh, after the puberty, uh, each month the most mature follicles they become to be sensitive for FSH, and about 10 to 20 follicles are activated. Here we can see activated follicles from many thousands, and those activated follicles they enter in big growth. They become to be uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary, so they are growing. One follicle uh, undergoes ovulation. And um, in other follicles, they undergo atresia. Later, we'll talk about this. And next month, in other follicles are still present in ovary and they are still primordial. So not all follicles are growing at the same time. Uh, only 10 to 20 follicles are growing. And next month, in other follicles will be activated and they will enter in big growth. But in other follicles are still resting and they are in minor growth. So um, those follicles, uh, many sounds of follicles which are present in the ovaries, it's enough to provide uh, reproductive function for entire reproductive age. Uh, and uh, let's go to the structure of the follicles. So here we can see primordial, early and late primary follicles, its secondary and its tertiary or graphian follicle. And here we can see gradual changes in their size, in their structure. But let's begin from the similarities, what is similar in all those follicles. So let's look at the typical follicle. Inside each follicle we can find a uh, cell, the biggest cell in the follicle, and it's developing ovum. And exact name of this cell is primary oocyte. So we can call this cell ovum, but we should know that exact name of the cell is primary oocyte, and also there is secondary oocyte and ovum, and they are the following stages. Uh, but we can uh, call the cell also ovum, uh, and it's uh, essential cell in each follicle. So it's a developing gamete of the uh, female reproductive system. So primary oocyte or ovum is present in each follicle. It's surrounded by a special envelope which is called zona pellucida. Here we can see zona pellucida. It uh, is composed of glycoproteins and this zona pellucida is involved in the fertilization process. Uh, when spermatozoa recognize this zona pellucida and they penetrate this zona pellucida. And after the penetration by spermatozoa, zona pellucida undergoes zonal reaction. And after that, this zona uh, becomes to be unpermeable for the uh, another spermatozoa, so it prevents polyspermia uh, fertilization by uh, two and more spermatozoa. And also, zona pellucida is present in the gut and developing blastocyst in morula and blastocyst, and it keeps blastomeres together uh, and prevents implantation in uterine tube. Uh, so it's already present in the follicle. It's produced particularly by ovum. And particularly by next cells, there are follicular cells. Here we can see follicular cells, or they are called granulosa, because those cells they remind us of granules, especially they are nuclei, round numerous nuclei. So there are follicular cells or granulosa cells. And they are epithelial cells, so they have basic membrane. 
here we can see, and uh, here we can see their basal pole, they are located on the basal membrane, and uh, here we can see uh, their apical poles, they are turned to the oocyte. Number of layers of granulosa cells or follicular cells, uh, it may be different, and also those cells may be uh, known as corona radiata, and later we will see what is the difference between those terms. So. The most common name for them is follicular cells. They are present in the follicle and they are follicular cells. What is their function? Those cells, they uh, first of all, they provide microenvironment for the developing ovum. They protect the cell and they surround the cell. And also they provide formation, they pro produce estrogens, main uh, female hormones, estrogens and uh, they are produced by the follicular cells, so they provide endocrine function. And these cells are the target cells for FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. So FSH activates follicular cells and they begin to produce estrogens, and also they are involved in the formation of zona pellucida. This zona pellucida is produced particularly by oocyte, by mainly uh, by the follicular cells. And uh, it's uh, the inner part, and also uh, follicle is surrounded by connective tissue, uh, and uh, it's called teca, special layer uh, near the follicle uh, which surrounds this follicle. Uh, and uh, there is teca interna in the layer, here we can see teca interna, and uh, teca externa. So teca interna, or inner teca, it contains special modified cells of connective tissue, teca cells, here we can see those teca cells or tecocytes, and uh, they aren't typical cells of stroma, so uh, they are uh, they have own name, and they surround the follicle. And the outer teca uh, or teca externa it contains many fibers, which form the wall of teca. And uh, why this teca exists? It's not only typical stroma; it's special layer of the follicle. And these teca cells, they produce male hormones, androgens. So those cells, they produce androgens, and uh, androgens are obtained by follicular cells, and follicular cells, they produce estrogens from androgens. So estrogens, female hormones, are produced from male hormones, androgens. And there is special um, enzyme aromatase, which uh, activates this reaction. So, first stage of production of estrogens is production of androgens by teca cells, and after that, second stage is uh, their modification by the follicular cells, and it's activated by FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And in some uh, cases, in some diseases, this teca is uh, developed uh, more than in normal condition, and uh, teca cells they produce more androgens that it's needed. And it results in the virilization, uh, growth of hair uh, in the uh, typical place of uh, male um, uh, hair on the body, and also uh, some in other signs. And it's a result of uh, extra production of androgens by teca cells. And also, it may be a sign of sclerophyllocystosis of the ovaries when uh, this teca is uh, denser. And it results in abnormal ovulation or problems with ovulation because all of the ovary cannot be ruptured during the ovulation. So, typical structure of the follicle, let's uh, summarize it's uh, ovum, developing ovum, or primary oocyte. All follicles they contain primary oocyte, it's the exact name of this cell. And till the ovulation, this cell is called primary oocyte. Next, it's zona pellucida. Next, uh, follicular cells uh, and the basement membrane. Uh, follicular cells they produce estrogens and also teca, teca interna with cells, teca cells or tecocytes which produce androgens, and teca externa. Uh, it's composed of uh, fibers, mainly collagen fibers. It's typical structure of the follicle. And now let's look at the differences in different follicles, uh, how those follicles differ during their development and what is changed. 
Uh, here we can see follicle, it's a follicular cell, it's primary oocyte or ovum, it's zona pellucida, also follicular cells, it's corona radiata, and in other granulosa cells, and also teca interna and teca externa. And here we can see numerous follicles on different stages, uh, primordial follicles, primary, early and late secondary and tertiary, and we can find that uh, each follicle it contains uh, ovum, developing ovum, and also follicular cells, and in other structures they can be found here. So, let's begin from the uh, earliest uh, stage of the follicular development, it's primordial follicles. And uh, what are the structures of the primordial follicles? Here we can see essential part of the follicle. In each follicle we can find developing primary oocyte or developing ovum. And this ovum is surrounded by follicular cells. And they are flattened, it's epithelial cells, and they are squamous in primordial follicles. And also they have basement membrane. So, here you can see that uh, zona pellucida is absent on this stage, it will be produced later, and teca also is absent. So, essential parts of the follicle are oocyte and uh, follicular cells, and all other structures, may, they may be absent. So, what are the characteristics of the primordial follicles? They are the smallest in size, but they are the most numerous, uh, and uh, till puberty all the follicles are primordial. They are located just beneath uh, tunica albuginea, so they are located under the capsule in the outermost parts of the cortex, and uh, they contain one layer of flattened follicular cells surrounding the oocyte. So it's typical structure of the primordial follicle. And those follicular cells, they are inactive, they are squamous, uh, they are insensitive for FSH, uh, so they, that's why they are squamous. And they don't produce a lot of estrogens, so they have this shape and structure. And what will be uh, changed in the following stages of the follicular development? Here we can see a primordial follicle, it's developing ovum or oocyte, there are follicular cells, it's their base with membrane and surrounded connective tissue, but it's not teca now, because tecocytes they are absent here, it's simply a surrounding stroma. Uh, and here we can see primordial follicles, their appearance it's uh, Oocyte, primary oocyte, uh, and uh, it's surrounded by a simple squamous epithelium, there are follicular cells. And here we can see uh, its germinal epithelium, its uh, tunica albuginea, and its cortical stroma. And here we can find primordial follicles, so they are located just beneath uh, tunica albuginea. And here we can see those primordial follicles. There are all sides and uh, simple squamous follicular cells. And uh, after the activation, after the finishing of the uh, minor growth, uh, they become to be primary follicles. So what will be changed? Let's compare. Let's look at the follicular cells in this picture and in this picture. So what is changed? Follicular cells, uh, they are activated by FSH. They are sensitive for FSH. So they become to be cuboid from squamous. They were squamous, and here they are already cuboid. And uh, this layer of cuboid epithelium, uh, it's only a single layer in primary unilaminar follicles. They are also called earlier primary follicles. So they have a simple cuboidal epithelium which surrounds the primary oocyte. So two parts which were present in primordial follicles, follicular cells and uh, ovum, they are present also in primary follicles. But follicular cells, they are cuboidal and that's why primary un unilaminar follicles, they bigger, are bigger than primordial because of increase in the cells follicular cells and also ovum grows and it results in the bigger size of primary follicles compared to primordial. Uh, and follicular cells are simple cuboidal. And uh, another uh, important scene, what is changed its uh, development 
production of zona pellucida. It's particularly produced by follicular cells, particularly by the developing ovum, and it appears uh, between the follicular cells and uh, developing ovum. So, since zona pellucida is absent in primordial follicles, but it's already present in uh, early primary, primary follicles. So, here we can see structure of the early primary follicle. And uh, also, there are late primary follicles. Uh, early also are called unilaminar follicles because they have only one layer of the follicular cells. And late primary follicles, they are called also multilaminar follicles because they have two and more layers of the follicular epithelium. Here we can see this uh, two uh, layers of follicular epithelium, but there are uh, three and more layers. Uh, and uh, the main change is uh, increase in number of layers, so follicular granulosa uh, cells lie in some layers, and it's because of uh, mitotic divisions of follicular cells. They are activated by FSH and they undergo mitotic divisions, they increase in their number, not only the volume but also the number of those cells is increased. And also another change is um, formation of TECA. Here we can see formation of teca, and on this stage of late primary follicle, it's not divided into teca interna and teca externa, so one common teca appears. And uh, what is the result of those changes? Teca begins to produce androgens, and those androgens are uptaken by the developing follicular cells, and they are already activated by FSH, so they begin to uh, produce estrogens. And uh, late primary follicles, they are more active than previous stages, so they are actively producing estrogens. So it's the structure of uh, late primary follicles. And here we can compare its primordial and primary follicle. Primary follicle, it already has uh, zona pellucida and follicular cells become to be cuboidal from squamous. And uh, here we can see primordial and early primary uh, and cuboidal follicular cells. And uh, its appearance of primordial follicles, uh, simple squamous epithelium which surrounds them. And its appearance of uh, early primary follicle, cuboidal follicular cells with round nuclei are surrounded the uh, primary oocyte. And its uh, differences between early and late primary follicles, early or unilaminar and late multilaminar uh, epithelium become to, becomes to be stratified from simple uh, two and more layers of the follicular cells and also formation of teca. There are changes which occur in late primary follicles or multilaminar primary follicles. And here we can compare primary, early primary follicle and late primary follicle. Two and more layers of follicular cells uh, appear here and also uh, formation of teca uh, is present on this stage. And here we can see appearance of late primary follicle. It's developing oocyte, primary oocyte, it's zona pellucida which surrounds it. And here we can find uh, three layers of the uh, granulosa cells or follicular cells. And also there is teca which surrounds this follicle. Uh, so it's uh, primordial. Early primary with one layer of follicular cells is developing late primary because we can distinguish here two layers and it's developed late primary follicle with follicular cells, granulosa cells, it's uh, oocyte, it's zona pellucida and uh, teca surrounds this follicle. And let's found these follicles on this drawing of histological slide. So it's germinal epithelium, it's uh, tunica albuginea, and under tunica albuginea are located primordial follicles. They are the smallest, and their epithelium is simple cuboidal. And uh, under these follicles, there are uh, growing primary follicles, it's early and it's late primary follicle. It's uh, developing ovum inside, uh, zona pellucida and uh, one or numerous layers of follicular cells. And late primary follicle, it has developing teca. And here we can see late primary follicle and after some changes it becomes to be secondary. So what are the changes? 
follicular cells on this stage, they are growing, they increase their number, and they uh, are producing estrogens, uh, big amounts of estrogens, and uh, the fluid containing estrogens is released uh, in the spaces between the follicular cells, and small cavities are developed. Here we can see those cavities, and uh, there are specific feature or um, the secondary follicles. So in primary follicle, those cavities are absent, but in secondary they are already present. So there are cavities filled with fluid containing estrogens. Here we can see uh, fluid which fills those cavities. It contains estrogens, which are produced by the follicular cells. And the second change uh, in the secondary follicles is division of teca into two layers. Teca interna and teca externa. Uh, teca interna, it starts to produce estrogens. It produces androgens which are involved in the production of estrogens by the follicular cells. And teca externa, uh, it contains uh, collagen fibers which surround teca interna. So the main changes between a late primary follicle and secondary follicle is formation of uh, the cavities filled with estrogens and division of teca into teca interna and teca externa. Here we can see secondary follicle. It has small cavity or antrum of the follicle which is filled with estrogens. There are granulosa cells and it's teca interna and teca externa of the follicle. It's cavity, it's antrum which is filled with estrogens and there are numerous follicular cells. It's secondary follicle. And here we can found secondary follicles. They have some cavities, small cavities filled with estrogens. And uh, it differs them from late primary follicles. Uh, here we can see secondary and late primary follicles. Uh, follicle and secondary follicle is bigger than uh, primary. And it has cavities filled with estrogen and well-developed teca. And after some uh, days, uh, secondary follicles, they undergo changes which lead to form uh, tertiary follicles. So here we can see small cavities and uh, after that they are fused to form one common cavity. Uh, in this stage, uh, follicular cells, they keep producing estrogens, the volume of those fluid increases and uh, those uh, cavities are fused and they form one common big cavity which is called antrum. Here we can see the uh, tertiary follicle which has this big cavity. So what are the features of tertiary follicle? It's formation of one big cavity filled with estrogens and uh, uh, cells, follicular cells, now they form three groups. One group of follicular cells uh, surrounds uh, ovum or uh, primary oocyte, it's still primary oocyte, and these cells which surround oocyte, uh, they are called corona radiata. They uh, surround uh, the ovum. Uh, those cells which line the cavity of the follicle, they are called granulosa cells. Uh, and those cells which uh, attach uh, zona, um, this uh, cell, this corona radiata to uh, granulosa, they are called cumulus ophorus. So uh, follicular cells, they form corona radiata. Uh, it includes only those cells which surround this ovum. Also there is cumulus ophorus and uh, granulosa, it's lining of the wall of the follicle. Uh, and uh, this follicle is called mature or tertiary or preovulatory or graphian follicle. So this follicle is ready uh, for ovulation. So uh, feature of this follicle is formation of one big cavity inside the follicle. It's called antrum. And follicular cells they form granulosa follicular uh, cumulus or forus and um, uh, it's granulosa follicular cumulus or forus and corona radiata which surrounds the developing ovum. And here we can compare secondary and tertiary follicle. In secondary there are small cavities and they don't form one big cavity. But in tertiary there is one big cavity. And also in tertiary uh, follicular cells they form three groups. One group is corona radiata, second uh, cumulus ophorus and third is uh, granulosa follicular. And here on this picture we can see tertiary follicle. It's uh, ovum. It's zona pellucida, it's corona radiata, cumulus ophorus, and it's granulosa follicular, uh, teca interna and teca externa. 
And uh, here we can see also pictures of tertiary follicles or graphian follicles. It's antrum, it's ovum, uh, corona radiata, it's cumulus ovorus, and uh, granulosa, uh, which forms the wall of the follicle. And this follicle, it moves to the surface of the follicle, uh, to the ovary, and after that it will undergo ovulation. So here we can see tertiary follicle, it has uh, corona radiata, its cumulus of forus and its granulosa, its teca and its developing ovum and zona pellucida. Here we can see the structures and the tertiary follicle is located under the tunica albuginea under germinal epithelium, so it's ready for the ovulation. And here we can see secondary and tertiary follicles, uh, it's early tertiary follicle, and uh, here we can see uh, and compare them. One big uh, cavity is present in tertiary follicle, and secondary it contains small uh, cavities filled with uh, estrogens, and uh, this uh, tertiary follicle it has big cavity, and cells they form uh, corona radiata, after that it will be cumulus ophorus and also granulosa. So, what are the principal changes in the ovarian follicles during their development? Primordial follicle, it has primary or side and squamous follicular cells. When it becomes to be primary unilaminar follicle, this one, uh, zona pellucida uh, appears and follicular epithelium is simple cuboidal. It's, there are main changes. Uh, primary multilaminar follicle, next stage, uh, teca appears and follicular epithelium is stratified. Uh, secondary follicle, this one, uh, small, some small cavities between follicular cells appear and teca is divided uh, into teca interna and teca externa. And in tertiary or graphene follicle, cavities of the follicles, they form antrum and follicular cells, they form granulosa, cumulus ophorus and corona radiata. It's corona radiata, cumulus ophorus and granulosa. So there are principal changes in ovarian follicles, which do they undergo during their uh, development, which is called follicular genesis. And beginning from primary, early primary follicle, uh, this uh, process is controlled by FSH, which is produced by by uh, adenohypophysis and it takes about two weeks, uh, but uh, development of primordial follicles it uh, takes many years. Uh, so here we can see uh, primordial follicle, uh, it's uh, early primary or unilaminar primary follicle, it's late primary follicle uh, and uh, next it's secondary follicle. Um, and it forms tertiary follicle, which is ready for the ovulation. And here we can see primordial, primary, secondary and tertiary follicles. Uh, and uh, those growth of the follicles is controlled by FSH, hormone of uh, adenohypophysis, and it activates follicular growth. And follicles are growing, and follicular cells, they produce estrogens, and level of estrogen uh, growth. And till the second week of the ovarian cycle, level of estrogen it uh, achieves peak amount, and this amount of estrogen is high enough to activate the ovulation. And uh, ovulation is activated by LH. Uh, high level of estrogen activates uh, release of ovulatory quote of LH, also by adenohypophysis, but uh, uh, it's another hormone than FSH. So FSH uh, level of FSH falls, but uh, high level of estrogen activates production of LH, and LH activates the ovulation. And uh, now let's talk what is ovulation. Uh, so tertiary graphene follicle is ready for the ovulation and uh, living cycle of follicle is finished by the rupturing, it's called ovulation, uh, or site with corona radiata is released from the ovary. Uh, and uh, here we can see dominant follicle, it's tertiary follicle and uh, it will be ruptured and uh, our site will be released. So, what is ovulation? It's rupture of the wall of the tertiary follicle, uh, tunica albugina and the germinal epithelium, so entire wall of the ovary is ruptured, and it's followed by release of the secondary oocyte. So, we remember that it was primary oocyte, and now it will become to be secondary oocyte uh, in the moment of the ovulation. 
and ovulation is stimulated by LH, its luteinizing hormone. So here we can see follicles and this tertiary follicle is ready for the ovulation. It's fallopian tube and uh, how this uh, cell will be accessible for spermatozoa. Because spermatozoa, they can achieve through vagina, through the uterus, they can achieve fallopian tube. But how can they meet ovum for the fertilization? So this ovum should somehow uh, be released. And this released, uh, release of the ovum is called ovulation. So first of all, LH activates uh, ischemia in tunica albuginea, germinal epithelium and wall of the follicle. And it uh, results in the necrosis of some region of the wall of the ovary and follicle. And uh, wall is ruptured, fluid is released. And also ovum surrounded by follicular cells, it's corona radiata, so this complex is released from the ovary. And uh, this complex is obtained by the fimbria, special processes of the fallopian tubes. And this ovum goes to the fallopian tube, to the ampulla of fallopian tube, and here it's waiting for the ovulation, uh, for the fertilization. Uh, so here we can see a result of the ovulation, it's release of the ovum surrounded by the corona radiata from the ovary, and here it's waiting for fertilization, it's waiting for spermatozoa. And if spermatozoa achieve uh, the uh, fallopian tube and they achieve the uh, ovum, uh, fertilization is possible. And if fertilization uh, doesn't occur, uh, spermatozoa are absent here, ovum and uh, follicular cells, they die, they disappear somewhere in the follicular, uh, in the fallopian tubes. And after that, with mucus, they uh, may be released in the outer environment, uh, through uterus, through vagina. Uh, and um, if fertilization occur, uh, they got moves from the fallopian tube to the cavity of uterus. So it's uh, the finish of the uh, follicular phase. Uh, uh, ovulation it occurs on uh, 14th, 15th day of the uh, of the ovarian cycle, and uh, this is a fertile uh, period when a pregnancy may occur. Uh, so here we can see a release of the uh, ovum from the ovary to the fallopian tube and now this cell becomes to be secondary oocyte. Later we will talk about oogenesis, so this cell changes its name and now it's secondary oocyte. And uh, here we can see uh, ovary and uh, it's... Uh, picture taken during the endoscopic operation, laparoscopic operation, and its surface of the ovary, and its uh, tertiary follicle, which is ready for the ovulation, its tunica albuginea, albus, it means white, so this capsule, it has white shade, and its um, uh, tertiary follicle, uh, ready for the ovulation, and its follicular stigma, its place where follicle will be ruptured. And here we can see ovary with some follicles, and here we can see their entrums, uh, and its ultrasonography and number of the developing follicles also may be visualized. And here we can see pictures from the uh, laparoscopic operation. It's a non-expected finding uh, during the operation, and here we can see ovary. And uh, doctors, they have provided operation with some uh, disease and they have realized that there is an ovulation which is going on uh, right uh, during the operation. And it's the follicle, mature follicle, which uh, is located on the surface of the ovary and it's place where follicle is broken and ovum or egg is released. And here we can see released uh, ovum surrounded with follicular cells and fimbria of fallopian tubes they should obtain this ovum and um, this ovum will go to the ampulla of fallopian tube. Here we can see the surface of the ovum, it's zona pellucida and numerous follicular cells which form corona radiata. Here we can see it. And uh, its animation it shows uh, follicular cells of corona radiata and they surround secondary oocyte which is located in fallopian tube and it's located here under the ovulation and numerous spermatozoa are going uh, to it for the, uh, for the fertilization. 
And here we can see epithelium of fallopian tube. It has uh, numerous cilia which help in the movement of the ovum with follicular cells to the place of fertilization. So peristaltic movements of the fallopian tubes and also movable uh, cilia on the surface of epithelial cells of the fallopian tubes. Uh, it helps to move the ovum to the place of fertilization. So here we can see ovulation uh, and it's middle of the ovarian cycle. It's controlled by a leech. And what happens after the ovulation? After the ovulation there is a next phase which is called luteal phase. And luteal phase it includes development of the corpus luteum. So here we can see ovulation when uh, wall of the ovary is broken and uh, ovum surrounded by corona radiata is released, it goes to the fallopian tube. And uh, now let's focus on this uh, remains of the follicle in the ovary. What will happen to these cells? So this cell will be fertilized or, or it will die and disappear. And what will happen with these cells? These cells of the follicle, they will form corpus luteum or yellow body. Uh, and uh, let's look what will happen to these cells, follicular cells. They don't disappear, they don't die. They undergo some changes which lead to formation of corpus luteum under influence of luteinizing hormone. LH, luteinizing hormone, which is a hormone which activates formation of corpus luteum. So, corpus luteum is formed by both granulosa cells and tackle cells after ovulation has occurred. Here we can see corpus luteum, uh, its formation. And uh, first of all, the wall of the follicle collapses and into folded structure. Here we can see numerous folds. And vascularization increases and connective tissue network is formed. Uh, so let's look. Here we can see granulosa cells or follicular cells of the follicle. They are basement membrane and there are teca interna, teca externa. And uh, here we can see uh, blood uh, clot, it's a result, uh, it's the hemorrhage, it's a result of the broken follicle. So when follicle is broken, some uh, blood vessels are damaged and uh, blood may be present here inside the follicle. And also loose fibrous connective tissue grows inside the follicle. And it forms connective tissue scar inside the follicle. So here we can see filled uh, follicle with connective tissue. And also under influence of luteinizing hormone, the follicular cells, they undergo multiple mitotic divisions. So their number increases and we call this proliferation. Here we can see proliferation, proliferating follicular cells or granulosa cells. It's called proliferation. And the same thing uh, occurs with uh, teca cells. They also proliferate. Their number increases. So it's proliferation. And also blood vessels are growing between the follicular cells. We know that follicular cells, they are uh, epithelial cells, it's epithelium. And uh, we know that there is the rule that uh, blood vessels are absent in epithelia. But connective tissue grows inside the follicle and capillaries, they also are growing between the follicular cells. And we call this vascularization. So, the first stage of the formation of corpus luteum is called proliferation, proliferation of the follicular cells and vascularization, growth of the blood vessels. So, first stage, proliferation and vascularization. And after that, we can see that uh, cells, um, they change their functioning. So, teca interna cells and granulosa cells, they start accumulating yellow pigment, which is called lutein. Lutein, luteus, it's yellow. And uh, they begin to produce hormones, progesterone and um, some amount of estrogens. So, uh, these cells, they undergo glandular metamorphosis. Here we can see these cells and they begin to produce uh, lutein. Uh, and these cells also, uh, so both kinds of cells, uh, granulosa cells and teca cells, they produce lutein, so they become to be yellow, which gives the name for the corpus luteum, luteus it's yellow, and uh, also they produce progesterone, and uh, this stage is called glandular metamorphosis, it's the second stage of the development of corpus luteum, so first proliferation and vascularization, second it's glandular metamorphosis. 
and the third stage is flowering corpus luteum when the cells are actively producing progesterone and some amount of estrogens. Uh, it's controlled by LH, so it's uh, middle of the second half of ovarian cycle. It's between third and fourth weeks, and progesterone uh, is produced, and progesterone activates changes in the uterus. The uterus is getting ready for the possible pregnancy because it may occur after the ovulation, and uh, it's controlled by progesterone, which is produced by the uh, corpus luteum cells. And here we can see uh, corpus luteum during this stage of flowering. Uh, it's the longest stage when corpus luteum is actively functioning. It's wall of the corpus luteum, which is composed of luteocytes, which produce um, lutein and progesterone. So uh, two sources of the uh, development of corpus luteum are granulosa cells and teca cells. That's why there are two kinds of um, Lutein cells, there are uh, granulose luteocytes and teca luteocytes. Granulose luteocytes, they are bigger and lighter, and uh, teca luteocytes, they are smaller and darker, and they have more peripheral localization because they develop from teca, and both kinds of cells, they produce progesterone and some amount of estrogens. Here we can see cavity, its wall of corpus luteum, and there are granulosa luteocytes and teca luteocytes. They are smaller and darker. Uh, they uh, develop from teca cells, and granulosa luteocytes, they are lighter, and they develop from granulosa cells. Here we can see teca lutein cells or luteocytes. Uh, they are smaller and darker, and granulosa lutein cells or luteocytes, they are bigger. And between them there are numerous capillaries which receive progesterone after its production in lutein cells. So it's structure of corpus luteum during stage of flowering. And here we can see corpus luteum, its remains of blood, uh, connective tissue scar, and wall, which is composed of lutein cells. And here we can see scar, uh, it's uh, blood and wall of the corpus luteum and connective tissue capsule which covers it. Uh, and uh, different teca cells, uh, lutein cells, uh, there are lutein cells developing from granulosa and teca lutein cells. And here we can see them and between them there are numerous capillaries. Uh, so corpus luteum... Uh, is functioning during the second half of the ovarian cycle. It's called luteal phase. And uh, during this phase, corpus luteum produces progesterone. And there is high level of progesterone during this phase. Uh, and uterus is getting ready for the possible pregnancy. And also, second peak of estrogen occurs here because of production by corpus luteum. And here we can see ovulation, it's be between second and third week of the ovarian cycle. And between third and fourth week, uh, there is uh, one week from ovulation. So uh, in these days, uh, blastocyst may come from the fallopian tube if uh, fertilization occurs. So uh, in this period, uh, progesterone has the highest level uh, to provide uh, preparation of uterus and tenacity organs for the possible pregnancy. And if pregnancy uh, occurs, uh, progesterone level keeps to be high and corpus luteum exists during uh, three or four, uh, four uh, months. And uh, it's called corpus luteum of pregnancy. And its size is big, it uh, achieves five centimeters in diameter. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, beginning from uh, third, fourth months of the pregnancy, placenta begins to produce progesterone and uh, it particularly replaces functions of corpus luteum. Uh, and after that, it undergoes um, uh, involution. But uh, most often, pregnancy doesn't occur. Uh, and uh, if pregnancy uh, doesn't occur, uh, corpus luteum undergoes involution. And till the end of the fourth week, it undergoes involution and it becomes to be corpus albicans. And here we can see involution of corpus luteum. Now it's called corpus albicans and it's connective tissue scar which develops on the place of corpus luteum. So here we can see fall of progesterone level and till fourth week of the ovarian cycle, uh, level of progesterone and estrogen falls. 
and this low uh, level of uh, estrogen and progesterone and also uh, FSH LH it results in the beginning of menstruation in the uterus and uh, later we'll talk about changes in the uterus which are controlled by estrogen and progesterone so in uterus uh, menstruation begins and low level of progesterone and estrogen it activates uh, production of FSH in um, adenohypophysis and new amount of FSH is produced FSH level grows and it activates formation of the primordial, primary, secondary follicles and graphene follicles so new follicular genesis begins and level of estrogen grows estrogen achieves the highest level it activates ovulation after the ovulation uh, progesterone uh, is produced by the developing corpus luteum and if pregnancy doesn't occur level of progesterone falls corpus albicans develops and low level of progesterone and estrogens it activates new production of FSH so corpus luteum uh, which uh, is not result of the pregnancy when pregnancy doesn't occur it's called menstrual corpus luteum so menstrual corpus luteum it has diameter about one uh, till two centimeters and it exists during two weeks um, uh, corpus luteum of pregnancy it exists during uh, three or four months and uh, menstrual corpus luteum uh, undergoes involution and it becomes to be corpus albicans so uh, it's the fourth stage of the development of corpus luteum it's involution so uh, to make a summary there are four stages of corpus luteum development it's proliferation and vascularization first stage the second stage it's glandular metamorphosis third stage it's flowering when the corpus luteum produces uh, big amounts of progesterone and fourth stage it's involution when the corpus luteum becomes to be corpus albicans and all the cells are uh, replaced by the connective tissue and after some cycles corpus albicans disappears uh, so here we can see corpus luteum, its uh, connective tissue scar with remains of blood uh, and uh, here we can see um, the generation of corpus luteum into corpus albicans and here we can see connective tissue scar which is called corpus albicans because it has a uh, whitish shade uh, on the section and here we can see corpus luteum and after some months uh, its corpus albicans which after some months will be replaced by connective tissue stroma and it disappears completely so uh, to make a summary there is an ovarian cycle which includes uh, cyclic changes in the ovaries and it has three phases the first phase its follicular phase uh, second its ovulation and third phase its luteal phase Follicular phase is controlled by FSH, it's a hormone of adenohypophysis and it activates follicle growth. Follicles are growing and they produce estrogens. Estrogens are produced by the follicular cells. And after this, there is a second stage, it's ovulation. It's activated by LH, uh, which activates uh, release of the ovum from the ovary. And the third stage is luteal phase, which is controlled by LH. Uh, LH activates formation of corpus luteum and corpus luteum produces progesterone. So there are two hormones of adenohypophysis, which control ovarian cycle FSH and LH. They have cyclic pattern of their release. And uh, in male organisms, they also are present, but uh, they have continuous type of release. And they also have target cells. FSH target cells are sertoli cells of testes and uh, target cells for LH are Leydig cells. So they uh, are sensitive for FSH and LH, but they have a continuous type of production. But in uh, female organisms, there is cyclic uh, pattern of production of FSH and LH, and they activate uh, follicular phase during first and second weeks of ovarian cycle. Its follicle grows. Uh, between uh, second and third week, there is an ovulation, and third and fourth weeks of uh, ovarian cycle, its luteal phase uh, when progesterone is produced. And estrogens and progesterone, they are hormones, own hormones of uh, the ovaries, and they have target cells in different organs of female reproductive system and 
especially there are uh, cells of endometrium and cyclic changes of endometrium are called menstrual cycle and entire cycle in female reproductive system it's called ovarian and menstrual cycle and changes in endometrium and uh, uterus structure will be discussed in the second part of this topic uh, and here we can see hormones. So FSH it controls follicular phase. Uh, FSH activates follicle growth, and follicles they produce estrogen. Estrogen activates production of LH, and ovulatory cord of LH activates ovulation. And after the ovulation, LH keeps uh, controlling formation of corpus luteum. Corpus luteum produces estrogens and progesterone. And after that, when pregnancy doesn't occur, those hormones levels they fall, and new FSH is produced to activate new cycle. And uh, we know this uh, cycle of the changes of the follicles, which we have discussed. It's primordial follicle, it forms primary, primary develop into secondary follicle, and secondary develops into tertiary follicle. So it's known pattern. Tertiary follicle uh, forms corpus luteum, and corpus luteum after involution forms corpus albicans. It's typical way of the follicles follicular development. And we remember that about 10 to 20 follicles, they enter in big growth each month. So each month about 10 to 20 follicles are growing in both ovaries. And uh, usually only one follicle achieves ovulation. And it results that there is only one baby during one pregnancy, uh, sometimes two and more. Uh, it's result of multiple ovulation. When two and more follicles achieve the ovulation, uh, there is multiple pregnancy. Uh, and uh, when all of those ova are fertilized, and it results in the formation of bizygotic twins, uh, which uh, develop from two different ova. Uh, and also, we know that there are um, 20 follicles, 10 to 20 follicles, which are growing. Usually only one or sometimes two or three follicles they achieve their ovulation. What happens to others? So, why they disappear or what happens to them? And uh, they undergo the process which is called atresia. It's another way of their development when follicles they don't achieve the ovulation. So, uh, secondary or sometimes uh, late primary follicle, they excite from this cycle and they undergo atresia, they become to be atretic follicle, which will form atretic body. It's another way of the development of the follicle. So, only tertiary follicle, only one follicle will achieve the ovulation and it will form corpus luteum. So, usually only one corpus luteum is present in ovaries and it will form corpus albicans. But all other follicles, uh, which are developing together with this one, they become to be atretic follicles and then atretic bodies. So here we can see that during the cycle 10 to 15, sometimes still 20 follicles are growing, but only one ovulate. Uh, and about 99.9% of the oocytes don't ovulate and they undergo atresia. Uh, and uh, finally, only about 400 oocytes ovulate during life. Only 400 ovulation cycles uh, and all other follicles, they undergo atresia. Uh, so, uh, some follicles are growing and only one achieves the ovulation, its dominant follicle, and all others they undergo atresia. Here we can see ovulatory follicle and all others they undergo atresia. Uh, uh, atresia is the degenerative process by which all sites and follicles degenerate without having been expelled by ovulation. So what happens during the atresia? All site dies and zona pellucida undergoes hyalinization, it's collapsed and later it's hyalinized and follicular cells they produce hormones, they are still producing estrogens. And this atresia is activated by the dominant follicle. Those follicle which grows faster than others, it produces uh, honadocrinins, special hormones, which activate atresia in all other follicles. So the winner kills the losers. Those follicle which grows faster than others, it kills the losers. Uh, and here we can see uh, viable uh, 
uh, follicle with alive uh, oocyte and its atretic follicle without oocyte. And here we can see zona pellucida collapsed zona pellucida in the uh, atretic follicle and um, uh, it's a sign that uh, this follicle has uh, undergone um, atresia. So atresia is controlled by all other follicles. And uh, here we can see atretic follicle. Uh, it remains of the ovum and zona pellucida and follicular cells, they are still producing estrogens. So what is the reason of this? Uh, why so many follicles are growing when only one ovulate? Uh, 10 to 20, 15 follicles are growing. So many follicles, but uh, all other follicles will die and only one will undergo ovulation. First of all, uh, it's extra follicle for the ovulation. When dominant follicle will die, uh, another follicle will replace it. So ovulation will occur in any case. And um, also, usually two follicles, they uh, are dominant and one of them ovulate and another dies. Uh, and all other follicles, they die earlier. Uh, so, uh, some follicles they will replace if one follicle will not achieve the ovulation. And another reason is to produce enough amount of estrogens. Because when follicles are growing, only one growing follicle, it will not produce enough amount of estrogen to pr provide normal functioning of female reproductive system. So we need to produce to uh, uh, form uh, the uh, 10 to 15 to 20 follicles, which will produce uh, enough amounts of estrogens, which are needed by the female organism. Uh, and uh, in other follicles, they will not be able for the ovulation because ovum will die, but the follicular cells, they will remain here and they will uh, produce estrogens. So all other follicles are needed to provide production of estrogens. And uh, biological role of atresia is to uh, keep a normal amount of estrogens and to prevent multiple pregnancy because it's easier for a female organism to provide pregnancy with one baby only uh, than two and more. Um, so it's alternative way of the development of the follicles. Uh, so not all the follicles achieve ovulation. Some follicles they undergo atresia. And now let's go to the uh, next question. Uh, it's oogenesis, formation of female gametes ova. We know that each follicle contains oocyte. Uh, we call it primary oocyte. And now let's look how those oocyte uh, develops uh, and uh, what are the previous stages of its development and what will follow ovulation. So, uh, there are different cells which are uh, included in the cycle of the oogenesis. And there are oogonia, the earliest stage. After that, primary oocyte, which we already know. Also, there are secondary oocyte and ovum. So, uh, four types of cells are included in the oogenesis. And those cells are uh, similar to the cells which are involved in the spermatogenesis. If you remember, there are spermatogonia, which correspond to oogonia in the oogenesis. Uh, primary spermatocytes and here primary oocytes. Uh, secondary spermatocytes and here secondary oocytes. And in the spermatogenesis there are uh, spermatids and spermatozoa. And in oogenesis there are ova. So, uh, the stages are similar to those in spermatogenesis. First stage is proliferation or mitosis, mitotic divisions of the uh, developing oogonia. Here we can see numerous mitotic divisions of them and they increase their number. So, the same process uh, happens during the spermatogenesis. But there is a difference. In spermatogenesis, uh, proliferation or mitosis of spermatogonia it occurs uh, after the puberty uh, in adulthood and it's continuous process which uh, keeps during adulthood. In female organism, proliferation of oogonia takes place only during embryogenesis. So when mother of girl is pregnant, in the ovaries of uh, girl there is a proliferation of oogonia and uh, there are mitotic divisions and number of oogonia increases. So it uh, is present only during embryogenesis. Uh, next stage is formation of primary oocyte, and this process is called growth. 
when our gonia are growing, they increase their volume and it's called growth. The same growth is present in spermatogenesis, but uh, it happens uh, after the puberty and during adulthood, and it results in the formation of primary spermatocyte. Uh, and in uh, oogenesis, uh, it also results in the formation of primary oocyte. But uh, about the differences. Uh, uh, growth of uh, primary oocyte begins in embryogenesis and uh, it keeps growing uh, during many years. And we know about small or minor growth, uh, which uh, includes many years. It begins in embryogenesis and after that uh, big or major growth uh, um, begins, which is controlled by FSH. Uh, so uh, this process of growth begins in early embryogenesis, it lasts for many years, and it includes minor and major growth. It's development of primary oocyte. After that, uh, there is a meiotic division, first meiotic division when primary oocyte uh, enters in the first meiotic division, and uh, also, there is second meiotic division, uh, it's secondary oocyte, and it enters in the second meiotic division, which results in the formation of the ovum. So, uh, as well as in the spermatogenesis, there are two meiotic divisions, first and second. First meiotic division is division of primary oocyte, and in spermatogenesis, there is a division of uh, primary spermatocyte. Second meiotic division is division of secondary oocyte, and in spermatogenesis, it's development, uh, uh, it's division of secondary spermatocyte. Uh, but uh, what are the differences? In uh, spermatogenesis, uh, both divisions are equal. So uh, primary spermatocyte it forms two equal uh, secondary spermatocytes, and uh, both sper secondary spermatocytes they form four equal spermatids, equal in size and amount of genetic materials. Uh, but in oogenesis, those divisions aren't equal. Here we can see unequal division when uh, primary oocyte is uh, divided into one secondary uh, oocyte and a uh, small polar body, which uptakes uh, extra amount of genetic material. And second meiotic division, it's a division of secondary uh, oocyte, uh, which forms ovum and second polar body and first polar body also is divided uh, sometimes is divided into two so there are two following meiotic divisions and they aren't equal uh, we receive as a result of those meiotic division only one uh, gamete it's ovum and it receives almost all cytoplasm from primary oocyte and three small polar bodies which aren't involved in the fertilization they only uh, receive extra amount of genetic material which is needed for the ovum and in spermatogenesis, this division is equal. Uh, four equal gametes are a result of two meiotic divisions. And about the karyotypes. Oogonia are uh, equal to all the cells, of somatic cells of our body. Their karyotype is 2N to C. Uh, they have uh, deployed karyotype. Two chromosomes are in pair, and each chromosome is uh, single chromatidic. So two chromatids are present in pair. And uh, when they become to be primary oocyte, uh, they undergo um, reduplication of DNA, so its karyotype becomes to be 2N4C. Two chromosomes in pair, here we can see them, and four chromatids are present in pair, here we can see them. So uh, karyotype is uh, 2N but for C. And uh, these primary oocytes, they are present in all the follicles, and they enter in the first meiotic division, in, in prophase of first meiotic division, which begins in early embryogenesis. And this period takes many years, so this cell will finish this meiotic division only during the ovulation. And you can imagine how many years it will take. So uh, it's also a difference between uh, ovogenesis and spermatogenesis. In spermatogenesis, this phase also, prophase of first meiotic division, is also extremely prolonged. It takes about 22 days, but in female organism it takes many years. And prophase uh, of uh, first meiotic division is very long, and all the oocytes in the follicles, which we have studied before, uh, they are in the prophase of first meiotic division. And during the ovulation, uh, 
oversight, primary oversight, uh, it undergoes, it finishes the first mutic division and it forms secondary oocyte and also there is first polar body. So, uh, karyotype will be 1N, one chromosome in pair is present here, but two, C, two chromatids are present in each pair. So, karyotype is changed after first mutic division. And it uh, happens uh, during the ovulation. And second mutic division, uh, here we can see, it's a division of secondary oocyte. And it forms ovum uh, with karyotype 1N1C. And the same karyotype is present in the second polar body. 1N1C, one uh, chromosome in pair with one chromatid. And first polar body also may uh, undergo uh, meiotic division, second meiotic division. So three polar bodies, they uh, develop as a result of second meiotic division and one ovum. And this meiotic division, it happens uh, during the uh, fertilization. So secondary oocyte after the ovulation, it enters in the second meiotic division and is stopped again, but on the metaphase. In the first, it stopped on the prophase. In second, meiotic division, it stopped on the metaphase, and it's waiting for the fertilization. And only during the fertilization, the second meiotic uh, division is completed. So, when all those changes uh, happen, oogonia they exist only in embryogenesis. Primary oocytes they begin their development in embryogenesis, and they are present in all the follicles. During the ovulation, primary oocyte, it becomes to be secondary oocyte, and all the primary oocytes from the uh, atritic follicles, they die on the stage of primary oocyte. And uh, after the ovulation, only during the fertilization, secondary oocyte can finish second meiotic division, uh, and it will become to be ovum. But it will not be fertilized, it dies as a secondary oocyte. And here we can see secondary oocyte, it immediately enters in the second meiotic division after the ovulation. Uh, and here we can see metaphase of second meiotic division and also metaphase in the polar body. And it's surrounded by zona pellucida. And here we can see process of fertilization, so uh, male nucleus or pronucleus of the spermatozoon enters here. And it's, uh, it's the uh, meiotic um, division, second meiotic division, so those processes they take place at the same time. And here we can see male pronucleus, it's already waiting for the female, it's pronucleus uh, from spermatozoon, but here we can see that meiotic division uh, is still going on, it's second meiotic division, and when male pronucleus enters, second meiotic division is uh, rapidly finished, and a female pronucleus develops. So here we can see finishing in a phase of second meiotic division and telophase of second meiotic division with formation of female pronucleus. And here we can see they got with two pronucleus, female and male. Uh, they, their phase of their common existence is called uh, syncarion. Uh, it's zona pellucida. Now it may be called fertilization membrane. It's uh, first polar body which has undergone a second meiotic division into two and it's uh, also second polar body which is a result of second meiotic division but first polar body may not uh, be divided into two so number of polar bodies may be two or three and it's zygote it receives almost all uh, volume from a cytoplasm from the ovum and it immediately uh, enters in the first mitotic division of cleavage here we can see female and male pronuclei, and uh, they lost their uh, envelopes, and they form metaphase plate, uh, and all 46 chromosomes, 23 from mother, 23 from father, they form common metaphase plate. But we haven't phase when all uh, 46 chromosomes are present in the same nucleus. Uh, this phase doesn't exist, only a common metaphase plate uh, may be present, and it's the first mitotic division of the cleavage when blastomeres appear. And um, uh, they got, it receives mitochondria from mother, but also a male pronucleus enters together with uh, centriol. And uh, centrioles in they got are from father. So uh, they are needed and they are necessary for the beginning of the mitotic divisions. So uh, ovum, it cannot begin uh, mitotic divisions without male uh, cell center centriole. And it's needed for the initiation of the mitotic divisions in the cleavage. 
Uh, so, uh, in this uh, part of the female reproductive system of this topic, we have discussed everything about ovaries, formation of the follicles, uh, the development of ovulation, formation of corpus luteum and also atresia, ovogenesis. And in the second part, we will talk about uterus, vagina, fallopian tubes, memory gland and menstrual cycle. How do those organs, uh, adenohypophysis, ovaries and uterus interact during the cycle? So, that's all. And thank you for your attention.